Good morning, and thank you all for being here. So aside from being the Republican nominee for U.S. Senate this year, past year, my father has been a longtime student and teacher of the Bible, and he's thrilled to be able to talk to you today about intercessionary prayer. He'd like you all to know that, under the banner of Liberty Players, we're offering a dramatic reenactment of the life of Gideon Ormsby, a Manchester Revolutionary War major, as well as a discourse on American founding principles uh, called Brush Fires of Freedom. So we're available to come and speak at any school or civic organization if you'd like. So please let us know if you're interested. Now, here's my father, Lawrence Zupan. It's so good to be here with you, and it's such a privilege to be talking to you about a subject that is so vital and so useful and so timely. Government, and we are in the seat of state government right here in Montpelier, government at its best does what? It protects our constitutional and God-given rights, acting on the principle that it receives its very right to exist from we the people. Government at its worst tramples upon and enslaves us, relegating we the people to be mere instruments of its will, beasts of burden and fodder for its cannons. In other words, as Judah Ben-Hur heard from his slave galley ship master, we keep you alive to serve this ship. So which of the two courses which government could take do you see government moving in today? Do we see day by day a government straining to preserve our rights and our liberty, allowing us to retain our own hard-earned money and pursue our chosen destinies? Or do we see government usurping rather than preserving rights, abandoning the principles of thrift and care while seizing an ever-growing portion of our earnings justifying new liberty-destroying rules, regulations, and laws by the false anthem of their invented notion of the common good. I'll let you answer that question for yourself. But if it is the latter, where government is an end rather than a means, where it has a body and a life of its own divorced from the vital functions of the people from whom it has derived its just powers to govern, then I say that you, to you that we have a crisis of culture, character, conviction, faith, and education. Why is America great? It's simple. The Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. Why did those documents make us great? Because they enshrined human liberty as an inalienable right and codified the very inspired truth that governments exist to serve their people and not the other way around. So then, what is the job of our legislatures and our governments? Above all other functions, it is to preserve, protect, and exalt that human liberty consistent with the rule of law which protects all people's rights. But where you see storm clouds of confusion, chaos, and usurpations, you can be sure that the spiritual enemy of peace, decency, and order has insinuated himself. And you can be sure that the response required by citizens of goodwill and faith is intercession. Am I talking about storming the barricades of the Capitol with vituperation, vitriol, and violence? Am I talking about attacking the character of those with whom we profoundly disagree? Am I talking about civil insurrection? No. No matter our disagreement in the realm of ideas and beliefs, people are not our enemies. The barricades we must storm are the devil's strongholds. The character of our spiritual enemy needs no further condemnation from me. And the insurrection which we must spearhead is with the power and the authority given us by God through his son Yeshua, called Jesus Christ, to pierce the lies of our enemy more effectually than he pierced the side of our Savior, to nail to immobility the wiles and plans of the devil more firmly than he did our Savior to the cross, to entomb his destructive and hateful plot for mankind more convincingly than he did our Messiah. 
who got up anyway, as you know. For we know that our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, our Messiah, has exposed the lies of the devil. We know that he has come down from that cross, and we know that the tomb could not hold him. Praise God. And just how then will we storm these barricades, pierce these lies, plans, and wiles of the devil, and entomb his squalid strategies? Intercession. We fight a spiritual warfare with spiritual weapons. We fight with prayer. We fight with press fasting. We, f we fight with focused meditation on scripture. So we are called together today to intercede and to pray for our legislators. You may say they may not even know that they need or want our prayer. That's okay. Neither did we when our parents prayed for us. Neither do so many people who have been preserved, protected, and uplifted throughout history. We must pray that they receive the wisdom to act, to think, and plan in their vital job. Let's go to the manual for life, shall we? Ephesians 6.12 tells us, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. See, this is a spiritual battle. We don't, know, we don't need to go out and hurt people because we disagree with them. On the contrary, we need to hurt the spiritual enemy of God and us. We need to hurt him by attacking his strongholds in prayer. We need to attack, hurt him by defeating him with the power that God has given everyone who claims the name of the Lord and Savior, Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. That's how we hurt him. That's how we win this battle. As I see it, and as you can see, this is a vigorously active, spiritually sweaty endeavor we pursue. Let's face it, our spiritual enemy doesn't take coffee breaks or vacations. Mm -hmm. Hebrews tells us in 4.16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. We know so many places we're told to be humble. And yes, we do need to be humble because we need to know who God is and who we are. But we also are given the authority, the right, and the extreme privilege to come boldly before the throne of grace. Is boldness and humility in contradistinction? Not really. Because if you are humble before God, then you will have the wherewithal to hear from him and to approach him in the way that is without fear, which is what boldly means. We come before God without fear, knowing that we are his, and he wants to hear our prayers. He wants to hear us interceding. He wants to hear us standing up for him, his principles, his word, his son, and the people that he would have saved and directed unto salvation. In my next few comments, I'm going to borrow freely from an article written by a wonderful New Hampshire prayer intercessor named Annette Tuttle. You may be familiar with the book of Esther. In it, Mordecai, the close relative of a young maiden named Esther, who is removed to the king's palace, anxiously seeks to know of her welfare. He's got a personal interest in knowing what's happened to his foster child and relative. Esther 2.11 tells us, and every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and see what was happening to her. Later, when she was moved, he, quote, sat within the king's gate, 2.19. So he followed in physically, he went to know what was happening, and he was praying for her. You know he was praying for the welfare of his young charge. And gradually what happened is he moved to the threshold of power, to the king's gate. While Mordecai was pacing in the court, and you know when he was pacing, he wasn't just like an anxious father in the hurt hospital waiting for the birth, who is not a believer. He was praying. He was praying and asking God for guidance. When Mordecai was pacing in the court and when Esther was moved to the king's palace, you may infer easily that Mordecai was praying diligently and interceding for his young foster child. And now, watch the progress, progression here because it's very stimulating and inspiring and godly. And now he's in a position to have his personal interests begin to serve 
another larger interest, for it is here that he overhears a plot to kill the king, which he is able to help foil. And that is a good thing. And that also plants a seed of indebtedness from the king back to Mordecai, which helps to unfold this miraculous story. Mordecai had prayed himself into position. He prayed into the situation. He prayed himself into the position to accomplish an additional and a higher purpose. See, when we do the right godly thing in the circumstances in which we find ourselves, we frequently find that we get moved forward and upwards and elevated to a situation to do even more good for more people because that's the way God works. Amen. Yeah. When, he, when you are listening to what he wants you to do and you do it, he's going to get, it's just like, uh, it's a crude analogy, but when a young person is hired into a company, when he shows that he's capable and skilled at doing a certain task, the boss says, oh, okay, well, maybe he's ready to try the next thing. And then you quit that well and you keep moving up. We hear so many stories. When you think of Mordecai, when you think of Joseph, who went from the prison to being the regent of all of Egypt because he was faithful in little. God made him powerful over everything. Intercessors must travail in a laborious effort. You know, prayer isn't with your feet up, smoking a cigar with a martini, you know, and it isn't a three second throw the prayer up like you flick a quarter for halftime or overtime to see who gets the ball. No, uh, forgive me, forgive the football reference, you know, it's the <laughs> Patriots, so. Um, no, but intercession is a laborious effort. Intercessors here wore sackcloth and ashes, ashes it says in As Esther 4.4, 4, while maintaining the moral courage to withstand and to bravely resist and stand face to face against the enemy. Now, when we stand face to face against the enemy, it's not like a military battle in the five senses where we have to go nose to nose with a person and then vanquish them, no. But it's much more subtle. It requires much more concentration, more integrity, and more commitment because we are going face to face with a dedicated enemy who is, not, who is here to do nothing but to steal, to kill, and destroy, as John 10.10 10 tells us. But we have the Lord Jesus Christ, God in Christ in us, Colossians tells us. And greater is he that is in us John 4.4, 4, and he that is in the world. So even though we may face the worst that the devil can throw at us, and even though he may be fearsome in many of his aspects and impressive in some of his power, guess what? Greater is the God in Christ in each of us who believe than the devil who's already been defeated and is already walking through his death pangs because he knows his time is nearing a full completion. Because we have the victory, through God in Christ Jesus. Mordecai stayed in travail, letting Queen Esther inform the king. That was interesting. He didn't confront Haman directly. It wasn't necessary. He worked with godly direction about how to get this job done. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, because that would be a whole other half hour of the book of Esther. <laughs> and I'm going to assume some of you know that this Haman was an enemy of God's people. Amen who had a plot to destroy all of God's people. And that's why, and that's why it says, at a certain point, Mordecai says to Esther, who started out as just a lonely maiden, became the queen of Persia, and she is called upon to intercede for, to preserve the life of all the Jews, and she's nervous about it. He says, look, it's for a time like this that you've been placed here, and that if salvation doesn't come through you, it, God will send someone else. Then she st stiffens her spine, and it's a fascinating little section of scripture because he's, excuse me, he is basically telling her as a superior to a subordinate, spiritually at that moment, telling her, listen, this is what you have to do to save your people. And if you live, lose your life, she's worried about losing her life because if she approached the king without being called, and there was a law in Persia, if you approach the king without being called, unless he holds out his baton to you, then it's all over for you, mm -hmm. even if you're the queen. And she knew if she's going to go and approach him, she's putting her life on the line. Do I really want to do this? And he says, look, this is why you're here. This is the reason that you're in the king's palace as the queen, to preserve your people. And if you don't do it, someone else will have, God will bring forward someone else. She takes it in. I can see her taking a deep breath, and she says, 
okay, go and pray and fast for me. And he goes, and now all of a sudden it's flipped. Now she, since she's getting in God's will, she's giving Mordecai instructions about what to do spiritually. And he, in his godly humility, says, yes, ma'am, I'm on my way. There was no pride in him telling her what to do. He was doing God's work. And there was no pride, so little pride, that he was able to take instruction from his foster daughter to do what she said had been to do. That's when you're in God's will. It's not about pride or superior subordination. Whoever is walking with God should be listened to. And if they have the right instruction, then you obey them. So, um, so Mordecai stayed in travail, and his travail and cry rallied others to do likewise. Hmm, interesting. Do you think that our prayerful intercession, when other people see us praying and know of it, that they might also join in and want to intercede? Especially at a time right now when uh, I'm informed at this very hour, practically, um, a very heinous abortion bill is being considered where there's just no restriction on abortions. Where at the ninth month, at the very cusp of emerging into light of life, the child can be destroyed. Mm -hmm. How evil do we have to get before we, how, how evil do things have to get before we start standing up and screaming? This cannot be done in my name, in my state. I oppose it vigorously by speech, by action, by prayer. Because it's a kind of genocide, just like, uh, you know, I'm standing here talking to you about Haman's intended genocide against all of the Jews. And over here, there are people with uh, suits and ties on thinking they're representing mm -hmm. the truth and their constituents talking about killing babies as they emerge from the womb. Oh, and if they come out as a, alive for a botched abortion and they're on the table, do we then kill them also? Apparently, what's the difference? It's just a mass of tissue, the lies the lies of the devil. Yeah. So in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, and the king's command, because Haman had gotten the king sort of naively to agree with Haman, yeah, okay, go ahead, kill them all. You know? um, so the decree went forth that all the Jews should be killed. So wherever it arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When we have people that are purporting to represent us, who are talking about genocide of nine-month-old uh, uh, babies in the womb, it's time for us to have some sackcloth and ashes. It's time for our, us to have some weeping, gnashing of teeth, wailing, mourning, and active resistance. It's time for us to, it's time for us to storm heaven with our prayers and our intercession and pray a great deliverance that we get delivered from this evil. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, besides the evil that will occur to the children, what kind of judgment will occur to us who stood by and allowed this to happen? Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody here, if we were walking down the street and we saw somebody about to walk in front of a truck, we would grab that coat and pull them back. <laughs> you know, any decent person would do that. Of course you would. So that's the same thing here. We're talking about grabbing some, grabbing life and pulling it back. Mordecai fasted and prayed three days and three nights, and even refused Esther's sending him a change of clothes. He was praying it through. With our travails, God prevails. God needs us, wants us to do it, because we are sent as his ambassadors to be his people here on earth to represent him. As you can see from this amazing story, God released a strategy. He released a strategy to save the people of God. And he released that strategy in, re in response to the faithful fasting and prayer of Mordecai. It's amazing. This Haman, who couldn't stand the sight of Mordecai, because every time when he'd walk into the king's palace, he'd see Mordecai, wouldn't even look at him, wouldn't bow before him. And he wanted to kill Mordecai. So he went and constructed a big gallows. And then, in the meantime, in the middle of the night when Haman comes to ask permission from King Ahasuerus to kill Mordecai, he gets awakened in the middle of the night and remembers somebody, who was the person who thwarted the plot to kill me, the king? 
and I've done nothing for him. And he calls his assistants and says, who is this man? They say, look up, and, oh, is this Mordecai? Oh, and what has been done for him? Nothing, he's just, and where is he? He's outside, he's always outside praying. Nothing has been done for him? So the king is troubled. The next morning, Haman walks in to ask that same king for permission to hang Mordecai on the gallows. The same king and the same man who's thinking, how can I reward this Mordecai who saved my life? So the king says to Haman, what should be, when Haman comes in all proud and impressed with himself, the king says to Haman, what should be done to honor the man whom the king wants to honor? Haman, in his vanity and pride, thinks, oh, well, the king's talking about me. Well, the king should take off his ring and his robe and put him on a horse, and someone should walk him through the city square proclaiming, so be it to the man whom the king desires to honor. And the saying pleased the king, so he said, great idea. Go ahead, Haman, take that Mordecai, put him on the horse, and you parade him through the streets. Oh, bad day for Mordecai. Bad, he was coming to have him killed, and now the, he's going to have to parade him through the streets on the white horse and yelling out that thus shall it be done for the man whom the king chooses to honor. I think Haman's beginning to get the idea that things are not going well for him. <laughs> yeah. Guess what? When we stormed the gates of heaven, the devil's minions who were inspiring this abortion fiasco are going to start getting the idea that things aren't going well for them either. Because this is a spiritual battle. Yeah, I'm blessed that Ken is going to stand up and testify against this in the five senses world of the state capital, and that's extremely necessary. But there's nothing that can take the place of our prayerful intercession at such a moment as this. The genocide of the Jews, the genocide of the Vermont babies, I think that's a real parallel here. Mm -hmm. So, what the enemy means for evil, God uses for good. Genesis 50, 20 tells us. Joseph is saying, and I'm going to a different story because it pertains here, but as for you, Joseph is saying to his 11 brothers who sold him into slavery, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about as it is this, is this day to save many people alive. So because Mordecai prayed it through and finished the job, God used Esther to save the Jews. Be, and you know the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that Haman came to, uh, Esther held forth, came before the king. He held out the banner. She found favor with him. And he said, come. And he said, what do you wish? Her being guided by the, the inspiration of God didn't blurt out right away, oh, this evil Haman is trying to kill all of my people, because the king didn't even know she was a Jew herself. He just said, if it please the king, and if I have found favor in your eyes, could I make a dinner and invite you and Haman to come to it? He says, sure, go ahead. <laughs> and so she's, she's walking in wisdom. She's hearing from God. She's taking her steps. She's taking her directions from the Almighty. And at that special dinner where Haman and the king are there, she, he again says to her, what, would you, what petition would you have of me up to a third of the kingdom? I'll grant you. She's, you would think she'd say, this guy here, he's trying to kill every, all the Jews. Hang him. Instead, she still holds her peace. And at a moment of God's choosing, at that same dinner, Haman's evil is exposed. And there's a lot of details. Haman's evil is exposed, and the king looks at Haman. He walks outside in his extreme anger and comes back in. And when he comes back in, Haman has fallen down at the feet of Esther to beg for his life, and it looks like he's fallen upon her. And then the king walks in at that moment and says, and would you also compromise the queen in my presence? And then they just put a black bag over his head and took him out and hung him on the same gallows as he was going to hang Mordecai. Mm -hmm. And then she said, here is my prayer, my petition, that you would reverse the evil petition of this Haman and send it out across all the provinces, huge, 150 provinces or so, 
127 provinces, he was the king of a huge piece of geography, send out horsemen everywhere to reverse the decree so that the people of my people, the Jews, can stand and fight for themselves. And then as soon as the whole country knew that the king was now on their side, they all fought against the people who wanted to destroy the Jews, and the Jews were saved. And this Mordecai was made second to King Ahasuerus in the province. And he was a man who was rewarded with great privilege, power, prestige, authority, and wealth, even though that wasn't what he saw. He saw God's will. And the people of the Jews were preserved. Now, lest we, in this modern day, most of us being 21st century, perhaps Christians, I believe, might say that's a wonderful story about ancient history. Well, besides everything we learn from it, you might know that if Esther didn't stand up, the bloodline of the very Messiah, Jesus Christ, who brought us back from sin, death, and eternal damnation, would, would have been interrupted. We might never have had the Jesus Christ mm -hmm. that we know today. So this story is part and parcel of all that we have to be grateful for, now and always. So. Because Mordecai prayed it through and finished the job, God used Esther to save the Jews. Being an inter intercessor is not about you and about me. It's about God's highest purposes. Look at the incredible series of results which ensued from Mordecai's faithfulness and Esther's. The Lord blesses Mordecai by making him number two in the king's realm. The enemy of the Jews is overpowered and destroyed. The Jews were brought from sorrow unto joy. The Jews became spiritual legislators because their document countermanded the document of death that Haman instigated. As to 8.13, a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all people so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. Wouldn't you love to be an intercessor like Mordecai? Now do you say, oh well, you know, he was some really spiritually dead person. I don't, I'm not equipped to do to be another Mordecai or another Esther. Think again. The fact of the matter is that because of the Lord Jesus Christ and because of the day of Pentecost and because of the gift of Holy Spirit, we have more power, enablement, than dear Mordecai and dear Esther had. We have the ability to hear from God and act because we have, Colossians tells us, God in Christ in us when we have received the gift of Holy Spirit. Wouldn't you like to be second to the king in favor, grace, and power? In this case, the king of kings? You know, there's room at the top. Just because somebody else is second doesn't mean you can't also be second. Right next to him, a whole row of seconds to the king. For Mordecai the Jew was second to King Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews and well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his country. Would you pray in intercessory, intercessory prayer with me right now? Would you close your eyes and bow your head with me? Lord God, make us like Mordecai, watchmen for our cities, towns, states, and our nation. Make us watchmen who will listen to the Holy Spirit and pray accordingly. Almighty God, we want to be second to the King and so close to you and to your Son, our Lord and Savior, Yeshua. Almighty God, release an anointing for our governments upon us that we would have influence and that we would use it for the good of the people of our state and our country. Almighty God, help us to be well received by many and allow us to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven and to see your enemy's own evil devices turn back upon Almighty God, cause us to seek the good of our nation and the church, speaking peace to all the country. Almighty God, we desire to be people with a mandate and an assignment from you, our Heavenly Father God. Almighty God, teach us, like Mordecai, to pray into and to pray through every assignment you give us. Almighty God, help us to be intercessors here today, right now, and in the time ahead for the legislators of the state of Vermont, and for all those in authority throughout this nation. We lift 
every legislator up to you today, Father God, and pray right now that you would guide and transform the hearts of those who sit in authority in Montpelier and throughout the country with supernatural wisdom and guidance to always do the best and most righteous acts and decisions for the people who have entrusted them with this duty. We pray your hedge of protection over them, over the state capitol, over the state of Vermont, over our President Trump and Vice President Pence, and over our country. Every legislator, Democrat, Republican, or whatever stripe, we pray these prayers for. Help us, Father God, as we humbly come before you with grateful and eager hearts and, the name, and in the name of our risen and returning Lord and Savior, Yeshua, called Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you very much for your wonderful, kind attention. I appreciate this opportunity very much to share this message with you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I have a comment. Um, I can't help but look at what you're, you've presented and a lot of Christians do know the story and feel like you know, there was Mordecai positioned at the gates so that he was aware of what was going on and yeah. he knew the king's heart on different kinds of concerns and he also knew the heart of his people. That's essentially what Advocates for Vermont was trying to do too. We're trying to bring more people to be at the gates, right. to be the ones to listen in on what's happening on the decision making. And you need to be at the gates. And not just here at the State House, but also in our communities, in all of the different community boards. Too often times, we're praying just quietly, sadly in our homes. But we need to position ourselves to know how to be praying effectively for the decisions that are facing our times. I think that's well said, Martha. I agree with you. Yes. I, I'm in a study with Bible, Bible Study Fellowship, which is a worldwide Bible study. And we're studying uh, Samuel, first and second Samuel. And the, all of the, uh, through the study, and, and this morning again, your study, it comes to mind. There's nothing new under the sun. Saul was out to kill David, chased him for how many years. It's like the scene that we're living through today with the politics that's going on in our country. And if we'd only come to our knees and pray as David On that note, if anybody else would like to offer any additional prayers right now, feel free. I mean, I'm standing at the front of the room, but we're all here in fellowship together. If you move to say anything that hasn't been said, to pray anything that hasn't been prayed, please feel free to go ahead. I'm going to ask you a question, mm -hmm. because you've been up against Bernie and his socialistic agenda for our nation. Yeah. And I see it rolling out here in Vermont. Right. And I'm concerned. Yeah. And you must be too. Comment on some of the things that you see that Christians should be praying for. Well, um, first of all, in the five senses realm, I think we need to be speaking the truth about the lies on, on the political level that are being told, that are making so many people think that socialism is a benign and beneficent and useful and wonderful thing. So let me hasten to say that first. But we've just talked at length about the power of prayerful intercession. We need to pray against the lies of collectivism, of socialism, because the enemy is our spiritual enemy as Ellie said, there's nothing new under the sun, and the wiles and devices of our spiritual enemy are not new. If he was to expose himself immediately, like right in this room, in his full ugliness, nobody would follow him. But he disguises himself so well 
that people of goodwill, who don't know any better because they haven't been taught, think, oh, well, gee, that sounds good. So likewise, this whole Karl Marx and post-Marxian philosophy has been promulgated as something that will help the masses of people. Isn't that wonderful? The, mo the most good to the most people. Or the sweet-sounding but pernicious lie, from all according to his means to each according to his needs. Gee, that sounds just so wonderfully egalitarian. And if that really worked, everybody's needs would be taken care of. But of course, it's a highfalutin way to say that we nobody has property rights, that nobody owns what they own, and that we, as a government, have the right to steal from these people and give to those people. And by the way, pocket a little bit of a margin while we're doing it. So we have to speak out, and we have to pray against the sweet-sounding lies of socialism. Because the score is approximately 39 to 0 in terms of the number of uh, socialist losses and failures compared to the number of successes that have been tried since Karl Marx's pernicious philosophy has been spread. And right now, Venezuela is only the latest one that's collapsing in room. It was the fourth wealthiest country some decades ago with the largest proven oil reserves. And totalitarian socialism has turned it into the hugest basket case. When I presented Senator Sanders with this reality, he said to me, oh, well, why are you talking about Venezuela? Well, the answer is because Venezuela is the latest socialist failure. But which one did you want to talk about? Oh, and he says, oh, what about Sweden and Norway? Well, Sweden and Norway are not socialist countries. They are countries that preserve the rights of property. Now, they have made the mistake of putting a very high level of taxation on their people to support a welfare system that they have begun to realize is completely unsustainable and have peeled it back and are voting in more conservative legislators and leaders. Also, they have little cities, little, little countries. You know, one, uh, the neighborhood where Bernie grew up has more people than some of these Scandinavian countries. And to take that uh, welfare expanded system and to infer that it could work in a country of 330 million people is a big stretch. But even if there was some intellectual rationale that we could try it, the fact is they haven't tried it. They preserve property rights. People work. They get paid. They have the right to own property. They have rights that are protected by the laws of those Scandinavian countries. Which rights are taken away with socialism, little by little by little, until there's nothing left of what's called human liberty? And why is human liberty such uh, an indispensable gift from God? Because of that. It's precisely that. Free will and liberty is the most, after life itself, it's the most important gift that God has given us. He's given us the free will and the liberty to even choose to believe him and his Bible and his, the salvation he's provided. He doesn't impose his free will on anybody. But yet we vote into office governments who can take away our free will and replace it with the will of a government. It's ungodly, untenable, and does not work in favor of the people from whom the government presumably has derived its just powers to govern, which is what our declaration says. So once a government has transgressed to a large degree, the just powers to govern by imposing its will and acting as if it has a right to be, which uh, overrides individual liberties all the time, then we have a real problem that has to be fought at the ballot box. It has to be fought on our knees in prayer. And that's why we're here today. And I can continue, but you get the gist. The freedom, freedom. It's all about freedom. Amen. Yeah. You brought up the lies. The minute you said the lies that we're, we're, we're listening to in Vermont today, for me, immediately, my mind went back to when Bernie first started running for office as a socialist. And he didn't lie about it. I'm a socialist. And my friends all laughed about it. He'll amount to nothing. He'll, don't worry about him. We'll vote for him. He won't amount to nothing. And so we've given him that pulpit. 
to spread his lies throughout Vermont that socialism is socialism. Socialism itself is the lie. He didn't lie about being a socialist, but he prom promoted the lie which is socialism. Yes, he did. And we allowed him. This is what well, my prayer. We well, yeah. seek people's prayers with me that, that we look in the mirror at ourselves and say, how did we allow this? We didn't look, I mean, we, in good faith, I guess, I don't know. I. He's free to. He's, he's free to, he's, he's, and he, and Vermont has become his footstool to go around the country. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in my neighborhood in Austin, Texas, his signs were all over there, all over. And from his signs now are Beto's signs. Right. You know, and he's just spreading his venom. And we're not standing against him. Well, we're standing we don't against want to. Today, we're trying. <laughs> I do, but we need to do that more. I mean, they, when is when has Bernie been vetted? I've seen people. You're the first candidate that vetted him at all. Other candidates that have run against him. He's a nice guy. Let you know the secret. The reason I believe that I'm the first person to get in his face and basically tell the world while he's sitting there that his ideas are a big lie is because it's a subtle thing. It's because along with this socialist teaching is the inference that if you're not in favor of giving all these people everything, that somehow you're not really a person who cares about people. You're not really a person of goodwill. And God forbid that a politician would actually be construed by the, the population as not caring and not being a person of goodwill. I stand right up and say, the person of goodwill is not the person who pretends to give away other people's property to everybody else. The person of goodwill is the person who preserves the liberty of every citizen so that they can expand their destinies to their fullest and their highest. That's the person who really cares about other people. We don't need welfare so, society. So I'm, I'm the first person I know of that has expressed it in that way and has pierced through that, that barrier of not being not wanting to confront Bernie because somehow he's a bastion of, of moral rectitude. To the contrary, Bernie Sanders is a bastion of moral lies and turpitude. Bernie Sanders' lies are the same lies that in the 20th century caused the life of 100 million people in various national socialist communist systems. And the socialism that he uses here, and he tried to get me not to use the word socialism because he's losing the battle about how evil that word is, and he stops calling himself a socialist, is because socialism and communism are stepsisters, and one leads to the other inexorably. When you start taking away people's rights and you justify it because it's for the people's good and they give the government all that power, at a certain point, the people have no power left. Look at Venezuela. Look at Cuba. Look at Hungary in the last century and Poland and East Germany. Totalitarian top tyrannies that have left nothing left but a shell of rights for any of its citizens. We here, we here in America, still have rights, freedoms, and liberties where I can actually be standing here and the secret police are not going to come in and pull me away. So we need to preserve that. Well, we need well, to we do have it here in America, hmm? right here in my hometown, sitting around my dining room table, 12 Republican, no, not 12, but 12 people, a group of Republican, a very small group of Republican, mostly Democrats. A young high school student about to graduate. He's leader of Bernie's party in Vermont, in, within within the school in my town. And he sits there. I mean, I don't have to look beyond my town to see this. He sits there and says, "The only fair form of government is socialism. So it's not it fair. It's well, not fair that my father." can afford to send me to college and others can't go because their fathers can't. So what's your point, Ellie? We know that it's that's what they really do. to look beyond our own school. Yeah. It's right here. It's infected our 
our state in a nasty way. So that's why I'm dedicated to going to every school in this state that will allow me to, uh, five minutes or 50 minutes to speak on this very subject and to give an education to the students that apparently they haven't had in recent decades. Right, so that's my role. If you so want to help, we if you want to help, find, if you know anybody who has any position of decision-making authority in a school or a civic organization, whether they be young people, old people, in between, talk to them and get me invited there, and I will speak and I will teach the antidote to Bernieism. I am the antidote. I am the unBernie. I am the unsocialist. I am the person who proclaims that all men are created equal and that we're given unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that without the right to keep your own property and to live your own life free of overwhelming government control, there is no life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And I'm here to help us preserve it. So get me a pulpit or a place to speak and I'll show up. So if you want to, you know, you don't have to do anything, just get me the place and I'll be there. That's what I'm doing for the next year. So you know, I'm, not, I'm, so I, I'm not spending a lot of time complaining about what we already know about how bad things have gotten. I'm talking about what the antidote is and what the truth is. And when you flick, flick on the light in a dark room, the darkness isn't there anymore. What's troubling me, and I feel I need to, I'm on my knees for it, is parents are afraid to come, to say anything because their kid at school will be ostracized, you know, and harmed. There's, so they so they let it take place. They it's say, happened. It's been a gradual deterioration over decades, and it's not going to be turned overnight. It's got to be countered with the truth. It's got to be counted with the principles that made this country the greatest country in the history of the world. And the reason it's so great is because of the amount of freedom. So we got to speak out. Yes. And, and allow the kids to speak out. And yeah. with the light of Christ. And it is. It's really being dimmed down in a big way within the educational arena. Exactly. And I don't know if there's more on the itinerary for today, but I think, um, Mr. Kovner, are, are we all going to be able to join you and uh, listen to your testimony at the Capitol when it happens? I don't it know. Um, like it's in uh, room 46 on the third floor, I believe, from 1.30 to 4 o'clock. Um, Do you know when you're speaking in that right? I, I, I suggest at 3 o'clock, but I don't know how many people are going to be, I'm going to be there earlier. Uh, my testimony is going to be very short. Uh, I learned about this last night uh, through Guy Page's uh, uh, editorial that he puts out every week. And so I, I basically prayed about it and I put down a paragraph of words. Whether it's going to have any influence or not, I don't know, but I'm going to do it in that will and see what happens. Um, can anybody know? I think anybody can pop in. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think it would be an excellent thing for any of us who have the time to uh, attend the hearing for part or all of it to be there and to show our support for everyone who speaks up in that if committee. In to speak, you have to be on the agenda. Yes. Of so, of course, course, we're not going to be able to do that, but we can go and show support for you and everyone else who. It could be very simple. But I would suggest to you, we've had a private conversation. And the reason why Larry's Larry, Larry is doing this is because he believes this is what God wants him to do. He prayed about it. He got answers to prayer, and he's, he's going to step into his calling. It's as simple as that. I'm here because I prayed about it, and I'm going to step into God's calling. If you take a look at you know all the Old Testament people that God used, they weren't people that wanted to do the job. Moses said, hey, I'm not a very good speaker. I stutter. And God said to him, I'll give you the words. Gideon, grinding away, out of fear. God used him. And you take a look at all of the Old Testament greats. They weren't necessarily people of pride, good words, profoundness. They were just called of God. And they weren't necessarily obedient. They had to be convinced to do what they had to do. But if you're called of God, you got to step into what he wants you to do. What's the alternative? You can either walk with him or you can run away from him. Simple as that. Thank you, Ken. 
Any other questions or any other comments people would like to share or any other prayers people would like to make? Just want to thank you for making the venture and being part of what we're doing here and it will be projected in other settings and uh, thank you for stepping in. My pleasure. Thanks for arranging you all, Martha. And I thank you, that, folks. And I pray that you'll have many openings. Many. Thank you.